Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the webinar on why does my autistic child have bowel issues and what can I do about it? First of all, I'd like to just introduce myself. My name is Ella Carey. I'm a London, UK based nutritionist. Um, I practice in London. Um, and my own personal and professional experience is with children with bowel issues, gut health issues that lead to anxiety. Um, and I will also work with autism. My son had anxiety after a troubled birth and lots of antibiotics and gut health issues, which ultimately led me to doing the work that I do today. And so I have a personal investment. I have a personal passion about for children's health and well-being and gut health and everything around empowering parents to really understand their child's health and well-being and how to make the right decisions and feel confident about making the right decisions for your child. Because as a parent, I understand what it's like to feel lost, feel confused and feel worried about your child's health. And so I'm here today to hopefully answer any questions that you have around your child's constipation and bowel health. And we'll understand, we'll look into why it's so important why constipation can lead to other things, can lead to other complications, and what to do about it. So, let's dive right in. There we go. Thank you for your patience. Why does my autistic child have bowel issues and what can I do about it? So children with autism have more gastrointestinal issues and consequently can have more bloating, constipation, diarrhea, pain on opening the bowels, anxiety around opening the bowels or withholding. So children don't often children who have pain when they open their bowels, they don't like to go to the bathroom. They don't like to open their bowels and so they'll hold it and hold it and hold it. And then they can have something called encopresis, which is just <clears throat> soiling in their underwear. And encopresis, a soiling in their underwear, is actually a sign of an irritated colon. Sometimes children don't often know that they're doing this and it can just leak out a little bit. Um, and they can, they can, parents think that they might be lazy or distracted or just enjoy playing too much or maybe just don't have the sensation. Um, but actually often it's that the colon is irritated and stool will leak out of their, of their bowel. So what does your, the bowel movement say about your health or your child's health? So as a parent and a professional, I am always talking about people's poo, stool, and I'm always asking people to really look. And once you've opened your bowels and your child has opened your bowels, have a look inside in the, bar, in the toilet to really see. You can tell so much about what's going on by looking at your child's stool. So if you can look at type one <clears throat> here, Type one to two, that's very, very dehydrated. Your child needs a lot more water. It means that there's a very dry colon going in here. So hard lumps. <clears throat> and they might often open their bowels here maybe once every few days. So some children I've seen open their bowels every once every 10 days and that's very constipated, very, very dry. Then we're looking at three and four and that's fairly normal. So kind of like a sausage shape. And then five to seven, they're lacking fiber and their, their bowel are re is really irritated. Often they're eating very foods that are really irritating their bowels. So often the culprit can be gluten or dairy or lots of um, highly processed food that just irritates the bowel and can cause the body just to want to get rid of it quickly. And it can cause that very inflamed um, liquid stool. And that can often burn as well. So let's have a look at what can contribute to, to bowel issues. Let's put this. Not enough fiber. So we get fiber through vegetables. 
uh, slow motility. Motility is the movement and the passage of the stool through the gut. So when we're looking at slow motility, that means that uh, we can have a lot of bloating. The, it, there's a very kind of slow picture here. Um, low levels of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Eating the wrong foods or sensitivities. Dairy is a common cause of constipation. So really, really easy thing to do is just, you know, if your child is constipated and you suspect a dairy intolerance and you maybe can't get to the doctor's to do a test because of COVID, for instance, just take dairy out of their diet. You can give them almond milk, uh, oat milk. There's so many other lovely alternatives today. Um, do that for you know four weeks and then see how that helps their bowel. And so, so often it really, really helps. And it's a very easy thing to do. Um, poor hydration levels. So when your child isn't drinking enough water, the colon can get really dry and that can cause dehydration in itself and constipation. Um, often autistic children don't like the texture or the taste of water and so they will reject it. So, you know, there's lots of ways that we can have a look at getting children to drink more water. Um, too little exercise. So when we're looking at the slow motility, these two are connected. Peristalsis, which is the movement of the stool, the, the movement of the intestines, is governed by exercise and movement. So the more your, your body exercises, the more your gut will move your stool along, the, the muscles in the gut will move. So that's a really good thing to remember. Walking, jumping, running are all really helpful. Uh, bowel issues are more common in children with autism due to an imbalanced gut environment. So an overgrowth of bad bacteria that's fed by sugar, starches, processed food, um, and not enough good bacteria. So we get our good bacteria by being out in nature, out in the woods, touching soil, eating wild foods, eating probiotics, uh, taking probiotics, taking fermented foods, um, and eating you know, natural foods that really help the gut. So we'll really go into this later on in, the, in this webinar. Low serotonin levels. So serotonin is the feel good neurotransmitter. So if your child is feeling low and blue and has low mood, that can be a sign that they have low serotonin levels. You get your serotonin through protein and also relaxation, they're connected. So we'll have a look at these two. So this is peristalsis, the movement of the intestines and you can see the stool moving through here and that's governed by exercise so that's really what we want to do is get that moving when we're sitting down too often too much when we don't move around enough it can get really stuck and really stagnant and that there's no movement there also breathing i'm going to turn my camera on for this Another way that we can get this to move is breathing. So putting your hands on your belly, getting your child to do this, and imagining that you have a balloon and you're just filling up the balloon. And this is a really great thing to do when your child is on the loo and might be a bit anxious or might be feeling a bit stuck or might be worried about the pain. And you can really take away the worry and bring the attention down to the belly and just ask your, your child, just breathe. And what you'll find is it relaxes the colon, it relaxes the anus, it relaxes the belly and stool can move through very much quicker, very much easier. And if your child is younger, Breathing with bubbles, so that when you have the bubbles that you, you dip in, you take a deep belly breath and you blow. And this can be a really lovely way to get the, the belly, the peristalsis moving in the abdomen. And then the lastly, we're looking at magnesium. So magnesium can really help constipation. Um, and magnesium can lead, magnesium deficiency leads to anxiety. And then 
we're looking at diet here. So sugar, when we eat sugar, it causes magnesium deficiency because we, we use magnesium to metabolize the sugar. So if your child's eating a lot of sugar and has anxiety and is constipated, I think that write that down, those, that link there, you'd want to give a magnesium supplement, take sugar out of the diet, give more water and do the belly breathing and you should see a big difference in your child. So the consequences of slow gut motility. So remember, gut motility is just the, that movement that we saw in the last slide. So we're looking at nutrient deficiency, magnesium, for instance, is a big one, which can lead to low muscle tone. So your child might not uh, be able to run very far or lift, be very strong or have, and you might notice that their muscle tone is quite poor nervous system dysfunction. So maybe f feeling the sensations are different in their body, taste is different in their body, um, anxious. Also sleep is affected. Slow gut motility, so constipation leads to candida overgrowth and SIBO, which is um, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. And this can actually lead to things like mood issues, concentration issues, behavioral issues. Um, and so what we're looking at is really the physical and then how it impacts the mental and the cognitive and the development of your child. And then malabsorption. So the, the nutrients don't get absorbed, create toxic byproducts, which create a nutritional deficiency. And so we just have this negative cycle that we really want to we really want to sh change that cycle get in there and change some things and stop that cycle so nutrient deficiencies like i said can manifest as concentration issues mood issues anxiety and poor growth and then also Constipation can lead to skin issues, which can cause eczema and psoriasis. And constipation can cause a yeast overgrowth, which is, can ca cause, cause behavioral issues, aggression, allergies, and bloating. So if your child has constipation and any other of these issues, we're looking at, once you sort the constipation out, these other we'll call them manifestations of constipation, will reduce. That's the beauty of working with the body in a really holistic way, because the body just gives us signs that it's out of balance. And for instance, let's take eczema. Eczema is a sign that there's a too, much too much toxicity in the body, and the body is getting rid. So it can't move the toxicity, would like to move through the bowels, but there's, if there's a backup in the bowels, it comes out through the skin instead. So the body's always balancing itself. It's actually a very beautiful machine that works really beautifully. And once we understand how it, how it works and how to support it, we can really help remove any of these other symptoms. And eczema is a very easy one to work with actually. So, it's really important that parents understand that overflowing and soiling in the in the underwear is not diarrhea it's actually constipation when you have a, an overflow so there's a it's just the, the bowels are too blocked up and then the overflow happens and it leaks withholding poo if your child is withholding then they don't like to go to the bathroom because of pain. Then there's a really good book that you can read by Anthony Cohn, Constipation Withholding Annual Child. So maybe you could, you'll all have the handout of this after. So you can um, have a look at that to see if that could, that's helpful for you as well. With withholding, it's an anxiety and pain feedback loop. So just helping your child to relax toys, bubbles, depending on how old that your child is. Creating a really relaxed environment for your child. 
and the more the, the stool becomes softer um, and you implement the diet that I will talk to you about further along in this webinar, the, the pain will become less and the anxiety will become less as well. But it's really important to help your child feel really safe around going to the bathroom. And br that breathing that I showed you before, the belly breathing, is really, really helpful to relax the whole body and allow the stool to open, the anus to open and the stool to pass easier. So lots of people will use laxatives. And actually I've worked with older children who have been on laxatives since they were very young. And when they were very young, obviously they would take laxatives for constipation. And when they, by the time they come to see me, when they're older, they have severe anxiety. And that's because the laxatives strip the body of magnesium and impact the delicate microbiome, which impacts the neurotransmitter status. So pushes your serotonin levels lower, so causing you to feel more blue. Um, and the, the connection between the gut and the brain now, we're really seeing the impact of a poor gut health leads to poor mental health. So we really want to look at long-term, laxatives are a good short-term solution, but for long-term, we really want to look at why the child is constipated and really put in solutions, long-term food solutions, because that's really the way that we're going to solve this. So how can we look at long-term solutions for constipation? So the first one is probiotics. We'll get the microbiome rebalanced here. Um, and obviously avoiding as much as possible antibiotics. So we're looking at antibiotics in food, um, in lots of meats contain antibiotics, and it's important to eat organic meat and antibiotic free meat. And if your child has any infections or ear infections, things like that, you can give probiotics in the back of the mouth. Go to your doctor and just explain that you'd like to keep your antibiotics low and they'll work with you to find other solutions. Uh, so diet, increase your fiber intake. Linseed tea. So I worked with a little girl who was with, with a consultant, a gastroenterologist, a GI consultant in the hospital and she was severely constipated and she, I gave her this linseed tea recipe and he took, she took it to her consultant and he said it was so effective that now he recommends this tea instead of laxatives, which is amazing because it hydrates uh, the colon and instead of dehydrating, laxatives pull the water out of the body linseed tea if you boil up one tablespoon of linseeds in two liters of water it becomes quite a thick thick water and it hydrates the whole body and it's good for the brain it has omega-3 in it it's good for the endocrine system it's good for the nervous system and it lubricates the uh, the large intestine and it really helps the stools slide out much easier and it's just fantastic exercise as we've seen laxatives in the short term, and then belly massage with warm oil to soften up compacted stool. And then along with that, the relaxation and breath work. So we'll, we'll go into each of these. So removing sugar, dairy, fast food, fizzy drinks, and gluten, because these just can clog up. They take away nutrients. Uh, they take away water from our body and they, they just really can cause a buildup of toxicity in our bowel and add to the, the imbalanced microbiome. So how much fiber do we need a day? So children two to five years old need 11 grams, six to 11 year old need 14 grams a day. So let's look, we have a cup of spinach is four grams, half a cup of broccoli is three grams. So you can get the idea to build, to make 11 grams you could mix and match each of these. A cup of, half a cup of lentils is eight grams. Again, you will get this handout, but it's really good to think in terms of how much fiber your child is getting and how you can add fiber to foods. 
and then water. But often children aren't getting enough water. We need about five cups a day for children four to eight years old, 1200 mils. And this is just a list of the 10 top fiber foods. It's my son singing in the background, he's about to go to school. And then foods that are helpful for constipation is soups. And I love to use bone broth as a base because the glutamine really soothes the intestines. If there's any irritation in the intestines, the glutamine and the bone broth really helps. Fish, omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. Constipation can be due to inflammation in the colon. So fish is really great there, as well as the linseeds, as we saw earlier. Vegetables, 80% of each meal should be vegetables, and that way you'll know that you're getting the right amount of fiber. Water, linseed, ginger tea is great for stimulating digestion, and fennel tea is really good if there's any indigestion and really helping that, the, the soothe and calm the tummy. Kefir in the yogurt, if you can tolerate dairy, is great uh, probiotic rich foods. Let's just go back. And then magnesium. So spinach, nuts, seeds are really great. So elevating your knees when you're on the loo. So there's something called a squatty potty. And this is a really helpful thing to use when there is constipation because it really helps to get the colon in a better position excuse that disturbance colon in a better position for elimination so if you can see these two pictures the first picture the, the child is just sitting and his feet and pelvis is at a right angle and then the second picture his feet maybe 35 degrees higher and this can just help to open the colon better and to really allow the gravity to do its job and it reduces straining so that's a really helpful thing to you can just get a footstool um, and put that under the feet that's a really easy thing to do And then lastly, warm oil for abdomen massage. And this is a really lovely way to connect with your child. So you can use uh, almond oil, olive oil, coconut oil, and warm them up and just get a pan of water and put the bowl, put some oil in a bowl and put it over a pan of hot water and just really gently, don't ever let the oil touch a flame itself, but just, a bain marie just to really gently oil that water warm that oil and then you just rub in this direction and you can make it the, the atmosphere really calm for your child if your autistic child loves to be touched this is a really lovely way to soothe your child um, and it can really help sleep as well I know that my children really loved me giving them belly massages and you can do that from when they're very little, from when they're babies. <clears throat> and almonds are sweet smelling and relaxing. Olive oil is very easy to find in, often in most kitchens and coconut is antifungal and antiviral. And then last, so we have these behavioral programs. So this book is fantastic for toilet training uh, with children on the autistic spectrum and you can go to eric.com for more information about this book. And it looks at other ways, strategies to help children's understanding of using the toilets and building their confidence. Often it's about understanding as well. <clears throat> and feeling confident. So thank you so much for listening to this webinar. I hope you found it helpful. It would really make my day if you wanted to ask any questions. I'll be online for another um another 15 minutes 15 20 minutes and if you have any questions at all about this webinar about constipation about gut health about autism i'd really love to answer any questions that you parents have about your children
Okay. So if you have any questions, you can type them. Yes, Stephanie, lovely. Okay, what about the food? Is food also affects on constipation for children? Yep, so there's lots of food that affects constipation. There's food that helps to reduce constipation. So lots of foods that are filled with water, so vegetables, um, often cooking them really well. Often autistic children refuse raw vegetables and that's because the enzymes in the raw vegetables can be too strong for children. And so cooking the vegetables and making soups, um, stews, um, steaming them can be really helpful because it, it keeps the water content inside the food um, and it, that the water content and the fiber can be really helpful for constipation. But also in the same time, taking away sugar, as we saw sugar depletes the body of magnesium and dries the body out. Um, and so we take away sugar, we take away things like cakes, biscuits, um, anything that's, so breads, anything that can cause the body to kind of clog up, if you like. Um, so we're looking more at natural foods, so meats, vegetables, proteins, nuts, seeds, things like that, and taking away fast foods, taking away fizzy food, taking away burgers. Um, I've, I lead something called the gut and psychology syndrome diet with my clients. Uh, I lead my families with children with autism. I lead them through a nine month program. And often it takes about three to six weeks to see a really real big difference in constipation for, ch for children. When you, it's going through the food route is the slow route, but it's the long-term route because once you've impacted the, the bowel, impacted the digestive system, you're really changing the ecology from the inside. So it's, yeah, it's not the fast route, but it's the long-term route. But with foods as well, Zalish, you have in the webinar, <clears throat> you have the list of the top 10 foods for fiber. And so you just make sure that you give your children the, the 11 grams of fiber a day by looking at the chart that's in the webinar. Can red meat cause constipation? Um, that's a very general question. It's really, if you, it's really important to look at each individual person. So thank you, Regina. Um, for instance, there might be two people with constipation, both eat red meat, or, but one is constipated because of the red meat and one is constipated because of something else. It's, so I wouldn't necessarily say red meat causes constipation as a blanket. Um, maybe if they're having too much or if they're not chewing it well enough or if they're only having the red meat, but I wouldn't say it on its own, no. When my child doesn't make poop in three days, I only put suppository for them helping coming out the poop. Is it as viable for it as I do? Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> Thank you, Regina. Suppositories can be really helpful, yes. I've read, uh, Stephanie, how old is your child? I'm just waiting for the answer, five. Okay. <clears throat> and does the suppository help? And if the suppository helps, is it loose or is it uh, like in the, the stool chart that we saw, like a number one, you know, like a pellets? Yes, normal. Okay, great. So yeah, that's fine. That is fine. But I, you do want to be able to pass your stool, open your bowels naturally. Your, we want to get your child opening their bowels naturally without having to do uh, suppositories, but also three days is quite a long time. We're looking at hopefully opening their bowels every day. So, you know, do the abdomen massage, like I, I showed you the belly massage, do the breathing every day, make sure they're having, look at their food. What I love to do is uh, write down the food that your child is eating, 
and really looking at the fiber content of each food. Are they getting enough vegetables? Are they getting enough water? Um, and maybe they're having a bit too much sugar or just maybe they've got a food sensitivity. So dairy, like I said, can be a big one. So take out dairy, take out sugar, give lots of vegetables, give lots of water and try linseed tea and you should have um, a happy pooping child. <laughs> I hope that answers your question, Stephanie. Thank you. Hind says, do you recommend oats to be given daily? Oats can be really fantastic food. They're very nutri nutritious. Um, some autistic children have difficulty digesting grains, whether they're gluten free or not gluten-free. Um, oats are, should be gluten-free. Um, again, I'd look on an individual basis. If your child is very bloated, I'm, I, what I would do is if I give oats every day is I'd soak them overnight so that they're more easily digested the next day. What we want to do is just really look at your child, look at how that your child's health is and support your child's health at every step. So rather than it being about, for instance, red meat being good or bad or oats being good or bad, we're looking at, is it good for your child, your individual child? Um, personally, I, I like to, with my own family, we have a lot of protein because my family don't do very well on lots of carbohydrates and grains, for instance, um, because we have digestive issues and that's why I do the work that I do. So for instance, if for breakfast, if you're thinking about breakfasts, um, we'll have eggs, we'll have fish. Um, yeah, mostly in the mornings we'll have um, poached eggs and spinach and things like that, or some salmon and vegetables. And that's a really nicely, easily digestible, nutritious breakfast. Um, if we're having a busy or if it's today, it's raining in the UK um, and we want something warm and so I'll put some oats in a saucepan and leave them to soak overnight and in the morning make some porridge. And so oats can be a really lovely nutritious meal, but I wouldn't necessarily give them every day. I hope that answers your question, Hind. Nanita says, what if a baby likes to eat more meat only and he likes to drink plenty of water but still having constipation. He's two years old. Okay, so I, what I would do in that, that case is look at their birth, were they born, born naturally or born via cesarean. Children who are born via cesarean have less um, natural bacteria, diversity of bacteria in their gut. And so, so the reason why I want to be going back to their birth is because a two-year-old is very young to be having constipation, although it's very common for children, babies and children to have constipation. But the problem is, is when it becomes very chronic and then they have other issues on top of the constipation. And so I would want to be looking at why they're constipated. Um, and if they were born by a cesarean, then we'll look at giving them more probiotics. Uh, were they breastfed or bottle fed, then they'll have, if they were breastfed, they'll have m statistically more diversity of bacteria and so less likely to have food sensitivities. And if they're cesarean born and bottle fed, statistically they'll they just don't have the diversity of bacteria which can protect their immune system. So they can have more risk of having food sensitivities. So if these are in place, will the, the risk of them having things like, you know, dairy sensitivity, and you can be sensitive without being allergic. So, you know, being constipated is a sign of having a food sensitivity, but, you know, it's not a histamine response where you, you know, your throat swells up um, and you're allergic to, to the milk, for instance. And so the, what I would do is have a look, Nanita, exactly what your child is eating. Maybe more fiber is needed. 
uh, probiotics, um, and then looking at pro looking at introducing more probiotics for your child. Giving that belly rub, especially for a two year old, is so lovely. They'll it's very relaxing. Um, and also, maybe if you want to email me, um, we can also chat about reasons why your own child might be. I'd want to know a little bit more backstory about your child. I'm putting my email in the chat box. Um, if you want to talk about your child's individual case, I'd be really happy to do that. This is, and I really love talking about this because it's something that I don't know. So in the UK anyway, we're very British about poo. Nobody likes to talk about it, but it's so important. It's so important. And when people come to speak to me and they say, I say, how's your stool? And they say, fine. Okay. Um, all panelists and attendees. Sorry, I'm sending my email again. The, so people say, fine. I open my I open my bowels every five days, but they don't realize that's not normal because that they, they don't talk to anybody about it. So they think, you know, it's really normal because it's their normal to open their bowels every five days and they don't know why they're having eczema and they don't know why they're having bloating and they don't know why they can't sleep and they don't know why they feel depressed and all of these other reasons or other symptoms around constipation and they think that constipation is just is normal for them. So once we sort out the constipation, other things really get moving and working in the body. And actually with nonverbal children, when, when we look at their constipation and we get their bowels moving every day, I really see a jump in development and um, words and vocabulary really expanding. And there's a really big, strong connection there. So that's a really exciting connection for, for parents. So I've just put my email in the chat box. If anybody wants to take a note of that and send me any questions uh, regarding their individual case, I'd be really happy to discuss that. So I'm just going to wait just a few more minutes. So please take advantage. Thanks, Nanita. Take advantage of the fact that you can pick my brains, you can ask me anything, um, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Okay, lovely. It looks like that's all the questions. So if the panelists are happy um, and the attendees are happy, we will close this webinar. I just want to say thank you so much to the United Arab Emirates authorities and the Bright Start Foundation for making this a reality. Um, and this fantastic series of webinars of parenting in a pandemic that's just been so lovely to present, so lovely to be part of. And I hope it has been a really lovely resource for you, for parents. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a really lovely day. Thank you.